Good morning and welcome to our service on the 3rd of January, the second Sunday after Christmas and a Happy New Year uh, to all of you. While we are in Tier 4, we will uh, limit singing in the service. So we have one hymn, you'll find on page 9 in the order of service, uh, from east to west, from shore to shore. It was one of the early, first hymns that was translated uh, into German at the Reformation, the very first hymn book that was produced by the Lutheran Church in 1524, included some translations from old Latin hymns, and this was one of them. So it has very good Lutheran pedigree and even much older and longer Christian pedigree uh, before the Reformation. Um, I've slightly changed the way things are set out, so you will see little numbers one, uh, two, and three as the verse numbers. And so we will, <coughs> excuse me, so if we will have again, uh, we'll so divide the singing a little bit. Uh, so, uh, so the uh, top right hand side of my family, so that's Sarah and uh, Elias and I, we will be number one. Uh, if Daniel and Marcus and this side of the church will be number two, and then uh, Hannah and Rob and, and uh, John and Francis, if you sing the verses that are marked with number three. So one, two, three. I hope uh, that makes uh, some sense. And the gradual and the alleluia and verse will be sung for us. And everything else is spoken in the service. I hope that is clear. Uh, before we start our service, I will give uh, a few notices. First of all, in, in our prayers, uh, we pray for Essential Lutheran Church in Brandon, in Suffolk, and Pastor Samiets. We pray for the ELC restructuring process, which has started already in 2020, but will take up much energy and time in 2021, we will, God willing, will lead to the church being uh, sort of structured in a way that will further uh, es um, help us in uh, proclaiming and advancing the gospel in the UK. Uh, we pray for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in East Congo, which is a young church, and uh, they are very much, they, they, we pray for them because they are on the prayer rotor, but they're very much in need of our prayers. It's been a scene of uh, civil war for 20 years. Uh, some millions of people have died in that region. They've also had an Ebola outbreak quite recently, and they live in great poverty and have had many opportunities to become less poor if they would uh, forsake the Lutheran confession of the gospel, and they have chosen to be poor and faithful rather and rich and unfaithful. So they are very much in need of our prayers. And we also pray for the parish of St. John here in Fareham. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, Alice and Max. Alice is Anna and Rob's uh, granddaughter, whose baby son Max was born prematurely uh, only last week. And uh, thanks be to God, he's uh, doing well. But we pray for his quick, uh, uh, from, for his uh, growth in strength and in health. And we also continue to pray for Elena, who's uh, the uh, uh, only child of. Uh, uh, friends of ours uh, who has been diagnosed uh, with brain tumor quite recently is undergoing quite aggressive treatment at the moment and for her parents. Um, and so that we'd, we can get all the notices out of the way, uh, just to draw your attention to the fact that this Wednesday is the Feast of the Epiphany and we will have a service on Wednesday night at seven o'clock at Teachfield Evangelical Church. And that in two weeks time, we have our voters' assembly. But we now begin our service. If you're following the service online, you can uh, hopefully follow the order of service. If you're on the church website, it should be either next to or just underneath the video, depending on which device you're using. Uh, you can download a copy also uh, from a link, if you prefer, uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, or you can follow the service on page 184 in the Lutheran service book. And the hymn, there is hymn number 385 when we come to it. 
although we will sing it to a different tune from the one that's given in the hymn. And today's psalm is Psalm uh, 77, which we will speak together uh, after the first reading. So we stand now for the order of divine service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. New Year is always an opportunity for a fresh start. And it produces not only lists of resolutions, but every year, at least in the last few years, uh, it has also seen the proliferation of Christian articles, both in print and online, about New Year's resolutions. And they seem, seem to be divided into two, two camps. About half the Christian articles about New, Year is the, New, Year, New Year's resolutions are articles which tell readers what kind of resolutions Christians ought to be making. Pray more, read the Bible more, spend more time serving others, go to church more faithfully, all very good things. And then the other half, the articles seem to be articles which tell us that all New Year's resolutions are really a product of the law. They're all about what we should be doing. And of course, we are Christians through the gospel about what God is doing for us. So don't make New Year's re resolutions. Simply believe and receive the gospel more faithfully and more frequently. Both of those things, of course, are true. And they're not actually in competition with one another. You ought to be improving your life. You ought to be making changes, not just on the 1st of January, but every day. To live as baptized people, as the Catechism teaches us, is that the old Adam in us should by daily remorse and repentance be drowned and die. And a new person should daily come forth and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever, but beginning now. But it is also true that by telling you so, or anybody telling you so, or you determining to do so by your own decision will not make it happen. Because your willpower is insufficient to overcome your sinful nature. And it's from your sinful nature that all your vices and your weaknesses and your failures come. What, needs is, what is needed is for your sinful nature to be overcome. And that can only be done by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not work mysteriously or in the dark so that you have to just pray and hope that it might happen to you. But he has revealed to us how he works. He works through the word and through the sacraments. So when we hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And so we ought to hear the word of God frequently. When we pray, we have been promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we ought to pray frequently. When we gather together as Christians, we are being nourished by the word and the sacraments and by our mutual fellowship as fellow members of the body of Christ. So we ought to gather frequently and faithfully as the body of Christ so that the Holy Spirit might work in us that new life and put to death in us those sinful desires and their fruit that are determined to lead us astray from the kingdom of God. We are gathered here today as the people of God to hear the word of God, to receive the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, to pray, to be strengthened by a mutual fellowship, even when socially distant. We are gathered here so that the Holy Spirit might work in us true faith and true repentance. We need to do that at the start of this year, at the start of each week, because many sins still cling to us. We are weak and we follow too much the devices and desires of our own heart, as the Book of Common Prayer puts it. But God is faithful and just. At the beginning of each year, at the beginning of each week, at the beginning of each day, and throughout each day and night, he is with us with his promises. And he promises to all who confess their sins the full forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ on account of his suffering his death, his innocent shedding of blood by the power of his resurrection. That each day, each week, each year, throughout these lives 
and on the morning of the resurrection. He will be with us to heal and to save through the forgiveness, through the new life that the Holy Spirit brings to us. So we are here as people of hope, people of the future, of a future that is already delivered to us today by Jesus Christ, by his word and by his presence in his spirit and his body and his blood. And so, beloved in the Lord, let us now draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Just before we continue with the service, there's one thing I meant to say, which is that for the benefit of the online uh, worshippers, those who are joining the service uh, through YouTube, it would be extremely unhelpful if you could be very loud and clear in your responses to their hurt. So speak up boldly in your, in your armies and all your other responses too, please. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. What was man that the Lord might look on him, and the Son of man that he care of him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him to me in the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. And on earth peace of will towards men. We, we praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, direct our actions according to your good pleasure, that in the name of your beloved Son we may be made to abound in good works. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Christmas is from Genesis chapter 46, beginning, beginning at the first verse. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones and their wives, in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his offspring are with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters. All his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my troubles I seek the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without hearing. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eye on the I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my soul in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit may be in the Will the Lord spurn forever, and never again be favourable? As it is said of our soul, I will promise it as an end of Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will honor all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have remained there your might among the people. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, we need to The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side. The clouds of your thunder was in the world. Your ways was through the sea, your path through the great waters, you yet your footprints you were unseen. You led your people like a flock, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? The epistle is from the first letter of St. Peter, the fourth chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, 
as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. You, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from the Lord is your name. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. And when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother. And go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us confess together the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Amen. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We sing our hymn, number 385, from east to west, from shore to shore.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Father, your word became flesh at the birth of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Give us now the gift of your Holy Spirit, that your word may continue to take form in us, that our dying and sinful flesh might be transformed into the likeness of him who died for us and how lives and reigns for our salvation, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There are some times of the year when it's difficult to get all the uh, readings in the right order, and sometimes even lectionary committees fail in that task. And so we hear this Sunday the immediate sequel to what happened next Wednesday on this Feast of the Epiphany. But it doesn't really matter so long as we meditate faithfully on what God, God's word comes to us uh, on any given day. And so today, we ponder the strangeness of God's, of God's work of salvation. How very contrary it is to everything that we normally and naturally come to expect and what we normally experience in the world. In the world, success is success and failure is failure. Happiness is happiness, and joy is joy, and sorrow is sorrow, and loss is loss. What is gained is gained. What is held on to is owned. And so we orient our minds and our expectations naturally according to those rules. We seek happiness and joy. We shun and we try to flee from pain and suffering and disappointment and sadness. And when we see things going well, we call it success. And when we see things declining or worse, collapsing, we call that failure. And if we judge the work of God by that standard, then we will be permanently disappointed in him. Not just in our time. We, like all people of all times, suffer from great historical short-sightedness. We suffer from the lack of perspective that is necessarily ours. Because we inhabit this time, this very short period of time, which is our lifetime. And everything before it is beyond our reach, even including the beginning of our own life. And the future, well, that too is beyond our reach and is also something that we will, especially when it goes beyond our lifetime, something that we will never even experience. This is why predicting the future is such a perilous and usually futile job. There's even a title, a job title these days I've come across, which is called a futurologist. Somebody whose job it is to predict the future. And if there ever was a person who's overpaid by judging by success rate, he was a futurologist. Because of this lack of perspective that we have, and our great preoccupation with our own lives, with our surroundings, with our own times, we are all doomed to be hopeless futurologists. Not only that, but we are also hopeless judges of our own time. Because if we look at our time, we can easily conclude that God and his kingdom are really not doing very well. Not only on a global scale or on a national scale, but also in our very own lives. 
This is why it's so easy for polished and handsome charlatans to come and sell this false gospel, this poison pill that, is, that makes, has made some of them very, very rich indeed, with huge followings, who'd come and declare that God is victorious and powerful. And therefore, you can expect to be victorious and powerful too, if God is on your side. You don't have to be sad. You don't have to be disappointed. Suffering is not for you because God is victorious. After all, I mean, he raised Jesus from the dead. That's the ultimate victory. So if you share his victory, you can have a permanent smile like my smile. You too could stand as a permanent advert for Colgate just because God is so victorious that I'm so happy and everything's so well. Look at my mansion. Look at my private jet. Look at my beautiful wife and my well-turned-out children. And then you look at those people and their jet and their mansion, their beautiful wife and their well-turned-out children, and then you compare it with your own life. And I'm not just talking about the house in which you live, because your houses are perfectly nice and lovely. I've seen them. Nor am I being rude about your family and their looks or how well they've turned out. But the very fact that your life is not a life of victory, even when it goes, is going well. Because there's this one enemy that we cannot and will not overcome, and which no amount of Colgate and orthodontist, mir orthodontic miracles and TV production values will be able to come. And that's the black heart that I carry with me everywhere that constantly sends out its poison into my thoughts, into my speech, into my actions, and into my inaction. The sinful nature that clings to me. And the effect of the fallenness of the world and my fallenness on every aspect of my life, including the fact that my life is slowly ebbing out. I know that some of you are getting bored of my making references to the COVID-19 pandemic, but I will make another one. While it is a great tragedy that the world is suffering in the way that it is, and that so many people are really experiencing terrible hardship, that many, many lives have been lost. There are many people who are ill and many others who are working incredibly hard to stop other people from getting ill or the ill from dying. And that our lives are limited in the way that they are at the moment and restricted. There is something very, very, you'll pardon my using this word, very healthy about us being surrounded by sickness and suffering and death. Because it shakes us out of our delusion that we are somehow immortal or that we get to choose how long we want to live. And until we get to the number of years that we consider reasonable, any death is untimely and premature. It's good for us to be reminded of our mortality and the precariousness of life. Because the wages of sin is death. And when we see death surround us and come near and threaten us directly, whether timely or untimely, whether we have reached the, uh, the average age of death in this country, whether we are far away from it. We are reminded that the wages for sin is death. And therefore, today is the day when I need to repent of my sins. And today is the day of salvation when I ought to seek and may seek the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And therefore also, our perspective on the world ought not to be that of the world. When we see these, what, what happened at the time of Jesus' birth and following the visit of the wise men, Herod's response to the approach of the kingdom of God, Joseph's drastic action at the prompting of the angel, 
everything was in reverse. Where was that peace and goodwill towards men that the angels had proclaimed to the shepherds at Jesus' birth? Where was that universal reign of the Christ that the Old Testament prophets had prophesied? The revealing of the glory of God at the coming of his Christ. And all the nations would, nations would come cringing to the God of Israel, would come and worship at Mount Zion, and Jerusalem would become a holy city. Yet again, where God himself would reign. And instead, a wicked, pretend king was driving God's Messiah, the Saviour, out of the Holy Land, back into Egypt. The proverbial place of slavery and oppression from which Israel had been rescued and redeemed. Where, G where Jacob took his family as a temporary measure to escape famine. Only to leave them in the place where from, they would have, from which they would have to be led out by God's miraculous intervention 450 years later because of the oppression of the Pharaoh. And how instead of the children, the blessing of God being for which had, God had promised for the children of Israel from one generation to another, would instead be cut short at the slaughter of the innocent children of Bethlehem, bringing not joy to the world, but weeping and lamentation. Rachel refusing to be comforted because her children are. No more. Even these prophecies are upside down. Because the prophecy that out of Egypt I call my son, as some of you who came to the evening services might recall from this Advent, uh, past Advent season, that prophecy is not actually a prediction of the future. It's not a promise. But it's a word of judgment and condemnation against Israel. God, speaking through the prophet Hosea, begins with these words, out of e when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But that becomes the basis of God's judgment against Israel, because the more I call, the more they turned away. And now this is being applied to Jesus. He's not being called out of Egypt, but he's being sent away to Egypt. Whereas in Jeremiah... The verse that is quoted here by the voice heard in Ramah weeping aloud lamentation was in fact the beginning of a promise of restoration. And here we have nothing but destruction, not restoration. What is God doing here? What is God doing for us in our lives? That everything should be so back, backwards and upside down. Well, thanks be to God that things are upside down. Thanks be to God that they are backwards and not as we see them or hear them. God had Jesus sent to Egypt so that he might come back, so that he might fulfill in himself that thing which Israel had failed to fulfill. God condemned Israel for her unfaithfulness through the prophet Hosea and through all the prophets. He threatened and then carried out punishment for their wickedness. And the children of Rachel and of Leah, all the children of Jacob, in fact, were chastised and punished and scattered to the four winds out of the promised land, out of the holy land. The kingdom was disestablished was torn down, not to be established again by this time, by the time of Jesus' birth, for over 500 years. Until in the fullness of time, Jesus came. And what Jesus did was to take responsibility for that failure. Jesus came to be a new Israel, a restored Israel, to carry out in his own body, in his own life, 
everything that Israel had failed to carry out. To be the faithful son of God, which Israel, the adopted son, had failed to be. So that, through his faithfulness, Israel might be drawn back to God by being drawn to Jesus. And therefore, the rage and the fury of Herod, which, since it could not be directed against Jesus, had to be directed against others. So that those children and their families suffered for Christ's sake, the ultimate suffering of death and bereavement. That might become, in all its desolateness, the picture of the salvation that God brings through Jesus. We hear the uh, Apostle Peter in our epistle reading encouraging Christians who suffer persecution for Christ's sake. And the first people to suffer persecution for Christ's sake were little children who did not even know the Christ yet, but who already shared in his sufferings, who died for his sake. And we are promised in Scripture that if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. The little children died with Jesus for him. And therefore, though their fate at that time seemed hopeless, a life snuffed out, untimely and premature, premature and unjust, if ever there was one, yet their very death carried itself the promise yet to be declared. But it was only yet to be declared in our perspective of time. When God speaks, he speaks for all time. And therefore in their death was hope. And they were spared the sufferings of, of this life. And the limit was set on the suffering of their bereaved families. Because in Jesus Christ, God was working the reversal of the curse of sin and death. He was working the reversal of disobedience in the perfect obedience of his son. The perfect one came to die. He walked the way, if you like, of death and disobedience backwards. He began in obedience and ended up in death. So that we who, are, who must die because of our disobedience might be walked back from death. To obedient life, his obedient life. Our salvation is not in our avoiding death. Our salvation is not in our managing to avoid manifest sins, to become clean living and respectable people. Our salvation is us being united with, joined to, and living in the perfect obedient life of Christ. Because as the prophet Jeremiah goes on in the 31st chapter. The promise that God was making while, the, uh, while Rachel was weeping for her children who are no more, God was already establishing a promise, the promise of a new covenant. While they were still weeping and thinking that all was lost, God said, and this is the verse following, Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Christ took possession of all the promises that were declared to God, over to Israel by God, and made them his own by his obedience. And following his life of obedience, and his resurrection from the dead. And his ascent to the right hand of God the Father to hold all things in his hand. To rule and govern all things by the authority given to him eternally by God the Father. He now distributes those gifts to all who are his. All who are members of his body and therefore shares in those promises. We are not a new Israel replacing the old Israel. The church simply is Israel, because it is the body of Christ who is the true Israel, the true Son of God, the faithful one. 
and the saints of the old covenant and the saints of this new covenant are together united in him in receiving these blessings. When you read the Old Testament, you read the promises issued there to Israel, to Abraham's offspring, to Jacob, to, to the uh, patriarchs and to their descendants. You can read those promises for yourself now, but not for a patch of land in the Middle East, but for the kingdom of Christ, which is an everlasting kingdom, which is establishing itself over all the world, not through vic a visible vic a victory, through men and women grinning at you from their TV screens or by kingdoms established by, on earth by men, but by the preaching of the gospel. Your presence here today is a manifestation of the victory of God. The fact that you have been called and you have come, the fact that you have confessed your sins and have been absolved, is a manifestation of the victory of God over sin, death, and the devil. Satan has been beaten back. He has no entry into this room. He tries to taunt you from the outside and tries to lure you in. But you are safe in Jesus' arms here. You belong to him. And your victory is not in avoiding the common fate of mankind, in sharing, shedding tears and being disappointed and seeing loss and being deprived of health and of life itself. Your victory in Christ consists of the fact that those things are not a loss in him. But every loss is a gain. When you receive gifts of God, of joy and prosperity and peace, and all those things that the world seeks, you are being victorious over the false lies of the world, because you know that every good gift comes from God. And so you can receive these gifts as a manifestation of his love. And so your hearts can be drawn in love towards him, in whom there is no change or decay. And when you're deprived of these things, and when you, even when you've been persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're still proclaiming your victory in Christ because you know that the more that God is prizing you apart from the things of this world he's doing that in order that you might take your eyes off things that are changing and decaying and fix them more firmly on him who does not change or decay in Christ there is nothing but victory for those who belong to him. All things work for the good of those who love God. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. When we live, we live in Christ. When we die, we die with Christ. And those who die in Christ do not die. Because, as Jesus says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. We shall never die. We shall never be disappointed, except for a time. Our tears have an end date on them. All our losses are losses for the sake of Christ, in whom all and all things are nothing but gain. Jesus fled to Egypt for a time, but he returned in order to fulfill God's will and to gather for God a people. Those who follow Christ, beginning, and those whose lives are united with the life of Christ, beginning with those children of Bethlehem, must endure sorrow and suffering in this world for a time. But only as a prelude to everlasting joy in God's kingdom. Because Christ has put away in his own flesh the cause of all those things, which is our sin. In him, we have forgiveness of sins. Where there's forgiveness of sin, there is life and salvation. Where there's life and salvation, there is joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. These are our perennial, permanent Christmas and New Year gifts from God in his Son, Jesus Christ. And he calls us again 
And he calls us every day to fix our eyes on Jesus, to seek in him our hope, to seek in him our future, to seek in him our joy and our peace. And when we do, he will not disappoint us. May God guard you and keep you by his Holy Spirit, following Jesus in true faith and a holy life, until he returns to bring us to the glory that he has from his Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We stand for the offertory. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and bring me a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Since we have firm hope in God and his mercy and love, let us now turn to him in prayer and bring before him the needs of the whole church, of the whole world, and especially those whose names have been brought to our attention. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have For the Evangelical Lutheran Church in East Congo, Somali Lutheran Church, the parish of St. John, for Ascension Lutheran Church, for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of England, her congregations, and especially the upcoming restructuring process. For the Holy Christian Church throughout the world, and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, let us pray to the Lord. For Pastor Samuel, for Pastor Gurhan, for all pastors and bishops of the church, for all those who have been called to proclaim God's word and to teach it to his people, that they may be tireless and faithful in their callings. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this congregation, its mission and its people, for the Brighton mission, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for Westfield House, for the preschools and Sunday schools of our church, that those who teach and those who learn in them would be transformed by the wisdom of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and the renewal of life and have a foretaste of the feast to come. Let us pray to the Lord. For Elizabeth, our Queen, for her government, for the Parliament, for all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honourably and for the good of the people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts and sciences, especially those who work in the health service, in the emergency services and in our armed forces that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For teachers, 
and school workers and for the children who are, and young people who are about to return to school, as well as those who cannot return to school at this time. That God would protect them from all harm and danger and would lead our young people to grow in wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty or unemployment, especially those who are affected by the restrictions placed on us during this pandemic. That God, God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For all the faithful, that God's Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous spirit, uh, giving from the bounty that the Lord provides, to support the church and to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from sickness, loneliness, frailty of old age, those affected by the spread of the pandemic, Ron, Cindy and Nicola, Jean, Reg and Carol, Holly, Mike, Jeffrey and family, Ian, Doug and Myra, Howard, Jana, Sheridan, Holly, Rita, Diana, Desiree, Julie and Bethany and Jack, Alice and baby Max, Ilse, Claire and Phil, Johan, Charlotte, John and his family, Tim, Pauline, Sharon, Joby, Christine, Serena, Jenny, Michael, Freddie and Grace, John, Philip, Matt, Martin, Ken, Tressy, Val, Emily, Lena, Roger and Emily, Wendy, Ingrid, Anya and Neil, and all others who cry out to God in their time of need. That he would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who mourn, that in their time of sorrow they will not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For Emir and Sana and their family, and for all Christians who are persecuted for Christ's sake, that God would protect them and keep them steadfast in the confession of Christ's name. Let us pray to the Lord. For it's an answer to our prayers for Rob and for Greg. And for all his benefits to us, let us give thanks to God, and that he may keep us steadfast in prayer for the church and for the world. Let us pray to the Lord. For the Uyghur people of China, for the Yazidi people of Iraq, and for all persecuted people, that God would bring relief to their suffering and lead them to seek their safety and their security in his promises. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord O Lord, our Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful <coughs> the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is he to our safety. It is truly meet, right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have given us a new revelation of your glory that seeing you in the person of your Son, we may know and love those things which are not seen. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed to pray, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, thy Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thy Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thy Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. Jesus has come for everything is prepared.
Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to light of the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good. And his mercy Let us pray. O oh God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the Lord. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.